Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's a great joy for Ione and me to worship with you at Holy Trinity today. It's a fitting place to end our wonderful stay at California Lutheran, interspersed with a couple days in Phoenix at a gathering of 450 retired Lutherans. I keep telling myself that's not our new peer group, CLU is. Uh, <laughs> If you don't retain anything more from this sermon, I hope you take two words with you. And I know that I speak them on behalf of Presiding Bishop Elizabeth Eaton and your Bishop Guy Irwin when I say thank you. Thank you for the way Holy Trinity not only embodies the body of Christ here, but for the way you support the work of God in the ELCA and your synod, throughout the LCA nationally and globally. Thank you for being part of this church's vocation of higher education and social ministry and outdoor ministries and global ministries. Thank you for being a beacon of light and hope throughout the church. So when you decided to come to worship today, what did you come expecting that Jesus would say to you? What did you get up saying, this is what I expect God's going to speak to me today? And further, what did you come to worship expecting the Holy Spirit would do through that living word as it's addressed to you? Or are you just pretty glad that you're here <laughs> and you haven't really gotten around to thinking much about expectations? Well, lest you think these are rhetorical devices for the preacher, Turn to someone next to you and share. What did you expect Jesus was going to say to you today when you came to worship? What did you expect God would say to you? What did you come expecting the Holy Spirit would do through Holy Trinity today? Or be perfectly honest, I didn't think about my expectations at all. <laughs> but I have a plane to catch, so you have work to do. <laughs> if you have to move, that's fine. I mean it, talk to someone. <laughs> You, you suddenly decide to be Quakers, I see. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, not that there's competition between churches, but you did a lot better than the folks over at Ascension, the first two services, so. So I've been increasingly convinced, okay, you two back there. Kimball, I said, that's enough. That's enough, President Kimball. I've been convinced by the thoughts of David Lose, who teaches at Luther Seminary who said, we need to begin to think about what occurs in here 
as being in a rehearsal hall, not a recital hall. This is not a performance hall, this is a practice hall. When you walk out that door, you enter the performance hall. You enter the recital hall where life of faith is lived. And so when we come here, we come not only to hear God speaking to us and us speaking God to God, words of praise and thanksgiving, but we need to increasingly practice the faith by talking to each other. I literally don't think many of us will do that well in the performance hall if we don't practice here in the rehearsal hall. And I'm not telling you you are now the holy Olympic judges that are going to evaluate how the bishop, former bishop does in his rehearsal of his sermon, but it does give us some freedom. So did you come this morning expecting that God would say to you, you are holy? Did you come expecting that God would meddle with farm policies and practices and the rural economy and migrant workers and immigration reform? Did you listen to Leviticus? Don't pick all the crops. Leave some of the crops on the edge of the field so that the poor, the migrant worker who labored to pick those crops will not go to bed hungry tonight. Did you expect God to say, in this culture of mass deception, when the old saying, your word is as good as gold, I don't know when it was last said. Did you come expecting God to say, but I expect you to speak the truth to each other, not to lie. Did you come expecting God to say, you know what I expect of my people? That you're not going to bear grudges. Not going to bear grudges. You're going to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Did you come expecting that Jesus would say, don't resist the evildoer? Give to everyone who begs from you? Well, I know no one took Jesus seriously when he said, for those who want to borrow from you, give them a loan. I didn't see anybody take out their cell phone and call their kids and say, I rethought it, I'll give you that loan, no interest. And don't tell my kids I just said that. Did you come today expecting Jesus to say, love your enemies? Pray for those who persecute you. And just in case you peeked and said, yeah, that's what I expected, and I've actually done pretty well, Lord. And Jesus has a final word for you. Be perfect, Joe. Be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Now, the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount aren't new to most of us. So how do you react to them? I bet, well, I don't bet, but I've been praying mightily that the California Powerball winner is a Lutheran and a graduate of CLU. <laughs> You've been praying that too, haven't you, Chris? I know that. But I bet most of us have one of two reactions to these words of Jesus spoken to you. One is, they're so familiar that we almost kind of dismiss them. They hardly register with us. Turn the other cheek, okay, but we don't really do that. Love your enemies sounds nice. As David Lowe says, out of our trained indifference and familiarity with the words we rarely think deeply about what it would mean to actually follow them. Or the other response is, we take issue with them. Jesus, we know far more today than you did about domestic violence. We know, sadly, what happens 
When women and children have been told to te turn their cheek, they become victimized again and perpetrators are not held accountable. You can't possibly mean that. Love your enemies? Talk about idealistic? Why, Jesus, have you had a little glimpse of Kiev this week? Have you been following the turmoil, turmoil, turmoil in Central Africa Republic? Do you know what it's like in Syria? Jesus, if it's all right with you, on the new app that contains the Bible, we're just going to delete these 10 verses. Do you know what? Let me tell you something. Just kind of lean forward, will you? Just lean, lean a little forward. Because this is, this is serious. I think Jesus meant it. I think Jesus meant it when he spoke these words. And do you know how I know that Jesus meant it? Because these words became the embodiment of his life and ministry that unfolded after he spoke them. It was because he embodied these words that he was nailed to a cross by the most powerful of religious and Roman rulers and the most angry masses. When the mob came to arrest him, expecting violence, Jesus didn't resist. He endured their brutal flogging and beating. When he was prosecuted for the crime of blasphemy, he didn't even give a defense. Thus the charges stood. He carried his own cross. And not just the weight of the wood, but bore upon himself the weight of all of human injustice. He did what he told his disciples to do. He literally gave his clothes away, stripped naked, and then gave his very life away. On the cross, the masses and the powerful brought retribution down upon Jesus for Jesus having had the audacity to live in his ministry his very own words to his disciples and to you and to me in the way that he embraced the outcast and said you belong in the kingdom of God in the way that he relentlessly came alongside of the poor and the hungry and took the bread and the fish and made sure there was enough for all to eat this day, in the way that he extended that healing hand of God's mercy to touch those deemed untouchable and spoke words of forgiveness those to those judged to be unworthy of God's forgiveness. And then he had the audacity to say, the hungry and those in poverty and those who weep, to them belong the kingdom of God. At the moment of his death, Jesus called not for revenge or reciprocity or retribution, but cried out to God, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And in that moment, what flowed from Jesus was not only his blood, but the compassionate heart of God, God's reconciling love for you and me and the whole creation. When you were baptized, you were baptized into that death and that resurrection 
This Jesus who filled his own expectations full, who fulfilled all righteousness, who filled the law full, came into your life and lives in you. And you came into Christ's life and live in him. It's only because of that divine human exchange that we can have the audacity to believe that God still expects us to take Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount seriously. What if every morning when you get up, most of us here don't like to look in the mirror, but some of you do, but maybe in the shower, and you put your hand on your head. What if every morning you put your hand on your head? Please do that now. I take it all back about you and us, uh, Ascension. <laughs> and what if you said, I am baptized. I am chosen. I am a child of God. I belong to Jesus Christ. And then make the sign of the cross, the mark of the one to whom you belong. If you would begin every morning that way, you would be remembering that God in your baptism has promised to be faithful to you this day, loving you steadfastly, forgiving you mercifully, and in Christ freeing you, setting you free. Turn to someone and say, Christ has set you free. That wasn't so hard, was it? Now take your thumb and mark that one with a cross on their forehead and say, you are a beloved child of God. You know what those two little words of promise means? You are free. That means in the morning when you awaken, there is nothing you have to do this day, nothing you can do this day, nothing you need to do this day to earn God's love and favor and salvation. It's been done for you. It's God's work in Christ, crucified and risen, and it's God's gift of grace given for you. So the question in the morning isn't, when I go out into the recital hall of life, what am I going to do and will I do enough to earn God's favor? No, the question is, now that I'm free and don't have to do anything to earn God's favor, what should I do today? And guess what? The Holy Spirit has some pretty high expectations of what you're going to do each day. In fact, I think Jesus has more confidence in each one of you than you probably have in yourself. The life of faith is not for the faint of heart. Luther said faith is a mighty, living, active thing. In his preface to the com his commentary on Romans, he said, faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that you could stake your life on it a thousand times. He said, out of such faith, you are free to serve everyone, serve everyone, suffer everything out of love and praise to God who shows us such grace. Oh, you're going to falter, and I will fail, but the merciful God in Christ picks us up, frees us, forgives us, and sends us back out in the recital hall. Jesus said, you are free now. You are free to go and live the vision of God's reign that Jesus has given you in the Sermon on the Mount. So maybe you came with no expectations or low expectations of the Holy Spirit. Frankly, it's a lot safer to just come thinking, I'm going to go to that performance hall for an hour on Sunday, kind of participate and evaluate and then be about my life rather than to come expecting that because you are here and because God is here and because the Spirit works through the Word of God and it is spoken to you, your life is going to be turned inside out and then you're going to go out into the world and you're going to be part of a movement that turns it right side up.
because you are going to be about God's liberating, loving work of restorative and distributive justice. I love that CLU is focusing on purpose and vocation in the context of God's promise. It's a hazardous thing to do if we're going to take it seriously because Jesus starts talking about it in the Sermon on the Mount. This is your purpose. This is what you are called to do, not alone but in community. How good it's been to see at CLU students and faculty and staff taking this seriously. Valentine's Day, man, I'm a 60s guy. We would have had a love-in and a smooch-in. <laughs> what did they do? Yeah, they had a love as a verb. Let's talk. Let's talk about love in its active form in your tradition as a Muslim and yours as a Jew, and mine as a Christian, and yours as a kind of ethical humanist. And let's be enriched in the conversation in this interfaith allies movement. And then they gathered again Wednesday night and continued the conversation. Do you realize how radically countercultural those small conversations are in a world that sees religion in its most extreme forms today? People and young adults are turning their back on religion because all they hear are words of judgment and all they see are acts of violence and exploitation. And that form of religion is winning the day. But Jesus says, I have another way in mind. It is the way of going to all those walls that we erect to separate us from each other, to protect us in our fears and isolate us from those who are other. And Jesus says, my way is God's way of reconciliation, and that is turn those walls into tables of conversation and reconciliation. So of all that you heard Jesus say to you today, What's one word that you'll take into this week and work on as you practice the faith? Is there someone that you really have been harboring a grudge about and it's eating away and you need to get on the phone or email or text and say, can we talk this week? Is there someone where you think of that one and the pain of your brokenness is more dominant than your commitment to reconciliation? Is there some place of conflict in the world that you know you need to become more committed to, involved in the process of peace building? Do you realize what a difference the Holy Spirit is trying to make through you and through us and through those who bear the name of Jesus into the world. So what is this be perfect stuff? I don't think Jesus is sending you out into the world to try to be morally perfect or spiritually perfect. God knows us better than that. I think perfection here, telos in Greek, the image I have is of a fruit tree when it's planted. It reaches perfection when it is a fully mature tree and is bearing fruit. That's its purpose. It has reached its maturity. It is now giving fruit so that others might live and be nourished. Others might see the beauty of it. This is about a life of being maturing in the faith and so that you might begin to more fully bear the fruits of which Jesus has described them in the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is sending you in the power of the Holy Spirit with great confidence in you and high expectations for you, but you don't go alone. So would you put your hand on someone's head? and have them put their hand on your head. <clears throat> You've talked to each other, now you're going to touch each other. 
And I'm going to pray for the power and the anointing of the Spirit upon you so that Jesus' words may take flesh in you this week in all the places of the recital hall of life where God takes you. God in heaven, for Jesus' sake, stir up in these children and women and men the gift of your Holy Spirit. Confirm their faith. Guide their lives. Empower them in their serving. Give them courage in their loving and their forgiving, their justice-seeking and peacemaking, and finally bring them to everlasting life. In the strong name of Jesus, we all say,